Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with veteran jazz trumpeter Paul Letterall and band leader and vocalist Angela O'Neill. They discuss their new collaboration on the 2023 album called Legacy, out on the Outrageous 8 label. Paul has quite a history touring the world with the likes of the Rolling Stones, Debbie Harry, and Keb Moe. And this new material puts him in the deserved spotlight on a crisp, well-produced recording. We cover the union and meeting of these two, the album live shows the future and so much more enjoy <laughs> hello hi it has, it has been a second how are you brother i'm excellent how's life oh life is so good how is life with you guys i've had so much fun watching you guys on insta you're doing so much stuff uh out there in kansas city yeah, it's really it's it's actually quite stunning how many things Kansas City is up to. Like I was just talking to somebody from Romania that's a soccer fan and I can't believe we're getting the World Cup, but just seeing like even the NFL draft, I was here watching that in person and I was like, I can't believe you know, we're winning Super Bowls and all these things are happening and clubs are Dude. popping up. It's like things are happening. So it's amazing. It's amazing. Well, congratulations on the uh, success of your thing. Uh, yeah. Everything's yeah. really cool that you guys are doing. So we really uh, we are fans. And let me introduce uh, Paul Litterall. He just came on there. Hi, Joe. Hi, Hi Paul. What's up? How you doing? I'm excellent. I'm going to ask you first and foremost, both of you respectively introduce yourselves before we get in, and that way everybody has a context. I know they're going to hear the difference in gender, but at least we'll have a context and we can move on from there. Hi, everybody. My name is Angela O'Neill, and I'm the producer from Outrageous 8 Records. Hi, I'm Paul Literal, and I'm the artist that Angela produced, along with Bill Bodine. So let's start off here first and foremost, okay? We've all survived covid and I want to know now with new material out and kind of a new horizon, talk to me a little bit about how you survived it and what right now in 2023 at this point means for you. Luckily, uh, Angela kept us very busy. I've played in her band now for like maybe four, four years, five years. Uh, and uh, she kept us going by doing uh, Zoom recordings during COVID. And then we were actually, towards the end of COVID, able to do uh, an album together. And uh, uh, I also did another record for another artist, uh, a Greek artist named Elios, that we did in the studio. And that was kind of challenging because we'd go in, I'd go to the studio and they'd have the control room blocked off so you couldn't go in there and just the tracking room open. And I had to go in first and listen, put my headphones on, listen to the track play, and then leave. And then the sax player would come in and put his headphones on and do it and leave. And with Angela, we did like a video as well as like the tracks. So uh, I would be in my room, uh, like playing to the track with my uh, uh, headphones on. And uh, uh, we would do it that way. And it uh, those came out pretty well, but it kept us busy and doing something i mean i practice uh, practice is practice there's nothing like actually playing in a group to uh, nothing can take the place of that uh yeah you know uh what paul said is actually um really accurate we um what we our workflow during zoom was you know is i mean during covid was as soon as everything got really shut down the entire band and outrageous eight records would zoom together everyone who works with the band every artist uh the marketing people everyone would come on a zoom on wednesday night just like when we rehearsed and uh, then we'd figure out okay we're going to send you this piece uh take your cell phone put it on these settings record yourself on your cell phone with audio and high res, and then our super genius uh, video audio guy would separate the tracks out, and we created like a video and audio tracks from that material. Um, once we started to get more out of COVID, Paul and I started talking about his project, um, and we did one of our first outdoor in the backyard rehearsals once we could, and he and I were chatting. He said, you know, I have all these tunes uh, that I have loved over the years that have resonated with me. They kind of represent like a you know, a decade or so in my career. And I said, like a legacy. And he said, yeah. And I said, well, let's do a record because I think, 
you have a legacy worth of material, um, having started, um, you know, very young playing trumpet and then having joined the U.S. Navy Band and, uh, and then had an incredible career with the Uptown Horns out in New York City and, uh, and then toured with the Stones and the Honey Drippers and an unbelievable, uh, group of, uh, uh just lauded rock and rollers. Um, and so that's kind of how we put this record together. It was difficult to answer your question because what happened was we would start, we would do one track and then a shutdown would happen again and then we couldn't go back in the studio. Um, so yeah, Joe, to answer your question, it definitely had a hippity jippity kind of quality to it. And then it's impulsion, right? You've stopped because everything shut down again. You're like, okay, are we going back to the same place? Have we lost our spot there? We have to go to a different studio. Things like that happened. But we did it digitally. We did it digitally. So wherever you ended up picking it up, yeah, nothing had changed. So you were actually picking it up from the very same spot. Exactly. So it wasn't, it was more hard on you to keep the focus than it would have been the tracks. The tracks yeah. were coming, coming out great. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, and that's kind of the illusion of living through this time period is that we all had these kind of virtual realities where we could stitch them together seamlessly. And it was like, you know, there, everything had a continuity to it. Um, you know, the one thing, speaking of legacy, you two have a legacy together. How did all this begin? How did this union begin and, and, and getting into, I mean, as it culminated into legacy, how did all this happen? I forget who called me. Someone called me about, I don't think it was you, Angela, for your, for your band. Oh, really? Someone was Did you call me personally for your band? Well, Joe, uh, I think you out in Kansas City actually have a lot of big bands, and that is actually kind of the uh, um, the starting point, the jumping off point for the Outrageous Eight, uh, was that we all met each other playing in big bands. Uh, and once you start playing in big bands, you know, your friends call you and say, hey, we have this other one going. And I think that's originally how Paul and I met. Uh, was yeah, I we met through in, a big band. Right? Yeah, I came and sat in um, as a vocalist and a big band and uh and i loved the way that paul played and we started chatting and uh and that actually happened with all the other members of the outrageous eight as well and um and basically you know i said uh, paul and i started talking about his background and stuff and that's actually how we started talking about this project uh was you know what if we did some more of a contemporary take a contemporary jazz interpretation of uh of some of the tunes that resonated for paul yeah, and I I had uh, I had a lot of those in my head anyway. I, I I came to Angela with the list, and I said, "These are the tunes that I've kind of picked, and I need you to sign off on them and see if you think these are worthy of doing." And uh, but I I I had a real idea of what I wanted to do, and uh, I wanted to do something a little different than what I do in the Outrageous Eight records, which is more straight ahead jazz standards we, we 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 take standards and and really flip them out with the arrangements they're both uh, we have two great arrangers in the band harry smallenberg and uh, rocky davis and uh, their takes on tunes are very unique and different and unusual <laughs> let me say indeed uh, yeah i mean like we have a joke running joke uh uh angela and i about like if you took the vocal out of these, a couple of these tracks, you wouldn't know what tune we're playing. You, uh -huh. you wouldn't have any idea of what tune we're doing. And they're all a, a great American songbook, you know, classic songs. So it's, it's very hard <laughs> to yeah. like tell what they are, but, uh, or what they would be. But with Angela singing, there's no doubt what they are. So there. Yeah, we have a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, the same people, uh, Joe, who uh, work on The Outrageous Eight also worked on this record. Rocky Davis um, actually arranged I Can't Make You Love Me and uh, played keyboards uh, remotely at that point. You know, like I say, it was all half remote and then we'd be able to go back into the studio. Uh, I Can't Make You Love Me is the first single on this record that we released and we also produced a video for so the one thing about you two is you both have very, uh, very storied paths in the music world. And it's, 
I mean, it, it seems as though this happens a lot. You know, later on in your career, there's this kind of union. How good does it feel to have had all of this mileage and then to come together and to put this combined experience together on the project? Uh, it's terrific. I mean, it's uh, the only thing it's missing is you, you know, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I think that that to have experience is, is what makes the music uh to have deep emotion and and you can convey that more sometimes when you've traveled life and had many uh facets through many facets of it you can uh you it gives you a a perspective yeah i would agree i think um you know my background originally was classical music and uh and i find that everything i've done up until now like everybody says uh kind of has fed into my ability to problem solve um at this stage and uh and so and also just the depth of resources and also uh people that you know um you know we're lucky enough to know this these amazing musicians who played on this record and uh without them this record wouldn't sound like it does we're so thankful uh to everyone who contributed to this ultimately to this sound which we are really just thrilled that the record sounds as good as it does that's the one thing that struck out to me is that it is such a well-oiled machine. So my question to you very simply is, what are you hoping the listener gets from this album? Uh, I hope that the listener, that each song touches a chord in them uh, about a certain point in their life or when they first heard that song or whatever. Oddly enough, that everybody who's listened to this, a lot of the people listened in their car for the first time. And they won't take the album out of their car then because they say it's such a great driving record. And uh, <clears throat> I think that's so cool because so many records turned out like that, like Steely Dan. Steely Dan was like the perfect thing to put on if you were going on a trip or driving somewhere because each song had, was so unique and interesting. And uh, uh, what I call ear candy, the way that the different little things happen in the track that really pull you through it or make it uh, interesting for the listener. And I think this album does that because it, of the variety of the, of the tracks and the way they, they actually sound. Some have strings, some don't have strings. Some are, are more electric and some aren't that electric. Uh, the one thread is either, uh, the one constant thread to it would be me, but then the variety would be, I also have great vocalists on the album as well. Yeah, we were really lucky to uh, get uh, vocalists like Beth Anderson, um, who you may know, who's an amazing um, songwriter and vocalist and uh, just all around. She sang on Disney. Yeah, she sang a lot of Disney stuff. Uh, Anderson with an E, I always say. Um, and we just actually interviewed her on our YouTube channel talking about working on Shiver Me Timbers, which is a track on the, on the record. You know, I personally would love um, the thing that, I love about this record and it, it formed itself. You know, I think it's funny, creative endeavors, you do what you do to add to it, but it has a life of its own. And, uh, and when I listen to this record, it has, it, it's almost like a journey. And the reason I think people like it as a driving record is because it literally is a journey. I mean, hard times is a very interesting way to start the record because it's just kind of gets you in the groove. And, um, and then there's, you know, something like, uh, Something like making Whoopi, which is fun and teasy and, and, uh, and, uh, just all of it, it each of it has, it's a very eclectic record. Um, but I hope that people have a good time and they also have an emotional journey. I think it has some emotional depth to it. Um, and so what I would wish the listener would get out of this record is I want them to have some fun and get a giggle out of it and also have some experience so that they listen to the record and they, they get an emotional experience out of it. Yeah. And also we, with the singers that we, the vocalists we had on the record, uh, uh, having a different variety and different career types like Lenny Goldsmith who's more of like a Dr. John sounding uh, rock singer and I, I w we were going for that more New Orleans sound on that and as uh, Angela just mentioned with making Whoopi um, I work with another uh, contemporary rock band called uh, The Sound of Ghosts which is like an Americana band and that was uh, Anna Orbison saying that 
as well, uh, along with using, of course, uh, Beth Anderson, as, as uh, she, she already mentioned. Absolutely. Well, you know, the one thing, Paul, is that when you look inside, <clears throat> you see all the pictures of all these different incarnations of you performing over the years. And I know, Angela, you've done the same thing. And I'm curious, you know, there was probably a lot of reflection going on without live music and recordings and things going on. So I'm curious, what was the period in your career, or your life, as you look at this project, where you grew the most, where you really like came into your own and felt like I've arrived or I'm at a place where I feel like this is my voice? I would say probably during that, that Stones period, that, cause that was like the culmination of the high point of the, of the, uh, Uptown Horns to me. We played with everybody, did hundreds of albums and I mean, big albums. And they would, used to fly us all over the world to literally. I got flew to London to work on records. I got flew to LA to work on records, which didn't make a lot of musicians happy out here because there's a lot of wonderful musicians out here, but it was because of the sound that the, Uptown Horns had the, the four horn section. We were the same guys for over 10 years. And um, I found my voice in that, but I al- always wanted to do something solo, but never could find uh, the right uh, avenue to step off the bus with the Uptown Horns to, to go mm. pursue it. And it just sort of happened later. To do to actually do that, I think the the thing about it is, as you get older, though the uh, all those experiences go into the, your sound, into your playing, into your ideas, and I think that coming in now is uh, I can clearly state what I want to state on on records. About you, Angela, when you look back on your career, what was a defining period for you to find your voice? period to find my voice uh you know i you said uh when did you realize that you've arrived i certainly have not arrived um i am in the process of arriving um (laughs) (laughs) so i think that's still in the process um you know i mean i think the interesting thing is and having a voice uh, is an interesting question um because i actually it comes and goes uh, is how i feel i feel like there's periods in my teens when i you know played the oboe for ages uh that i had a really strong creative voice and then it kind of cycles through and then i'll uh, go through another period and my voice will feel very strong during that period and uh and now i just i feel like um I feel like what's clear to me is how much uh, I really love music and love making music. And, uh, and that's kind of where I keep my focus. Um, uh, and, and, and as a result, uh, just, you know, like I say, like making these tracks, sometimes it was really, really difficult. Sometimes we really went through it trying to finish something. And uh, the satisfaction of being able to uh, complete something that you set your set your eye on. I think that that is maybe if I had a voice, that is my voice. So the one thing from where I'm at on this end is that when I start asking about albums, you've already moved on. You've spent so much time putting effort into this. You're in the promotion stage, but you clearly creatively probably have moved to a different place. So my question to you is what's, what's happening now possibly with future um, collaborations or presenting this music live? Oh, that's a great question. You know, uh, we are actually, um, we are talking right now. We're putting together, first of all, a record release party, uh, which we're doing at the end of this month, which we're really pleased about. Uh, just to thank everybody who contributed to this, uh, Bill Bodine and his family, uh, Beth Anderson, his wife, and, uh, Chill, his son, contributed a lot to this record. And so, uh, then actually the next phase we're going into is talking about, um, possibly going out and playing, uh, live and, uh, and putting something together about that. That's still kind of in the work. But as far as collaborations go in the future, uh, you know, um, 
what we were talking about in the beginning is we still continue to rehearse every single Wednesday, just like we did on Zoom in COVID with the Outrageous 8. And the Outrageous 8 are actually playing at a new venue just opened here in Los Angeles called the Write-Off Room uh, on June 3rd. So we continue to talk about that project and other projects we might do in the future. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, to add to that, I, I am definitely looking forward to like taking this out and doing some live work on it and uh probably locally but also uh because of uh how how many places i toured there are people who know me in other areas of the country uh i'd like to to do that for sure you know i'd like to go and play some festivals if we could and you know i I'd, I'd like to do that and i i would I would love for the uh, Outrageous Eight to do that as well. I was lucky enough to do North Sea and uh, uh, Umbria Jazz Festival in Italy, uh, Jazz Festival in Switzerland that they had in Lucerne, um, and one in Germany. And I did some in Canada. I did the uh, one in Toronto and one in Montreal. Montreal had a great jazz festival there. Uh, so I would hope that that the record will... Uh, uh, get popular enough or enough people will clamor for us to get out there that some promoters will uh, reach out. So let's add to that cloud of promotion here. And I'm going to ask you this. Let's say you come to Kansas City. You play at one of our venues. Let's say the Black Dolphin, which is by the Green Lady, one of our premier places. And you two have to come up with a way of convincing people to not only see the show and be a warm body in the room, but to also pick up Legacy. And you almost kind of would need to do this in the length of a few tweets. What are you going to say to get people to get this music and to get in there and see you perform it live? How would you describe the show and the experience of Legacy? Angela? (laughs) See, I had the feeling that was going to happen. It was going to go back and forth. This is like spy versus spy. (laughs) No, no, no. Let's see. In a couple of tweets. uh, that uh, Okay. You know, I think... Uh, if you want to have a good foot tapping time listening to some amazing, uh, like unbelievable trumpet playing, if you're a fan of trumpet, uh, I think you want to come down and hear this show. That sounds pretty good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, yes. uh, <clears throat> I'm sure that they've heard me on like, a lot of records that they'd listened to over the ages and to see somebody under the radar that they've never might not have been aware of before this would be a way to get it done but i'm hopeful that they'll have already listened to the record and be curious about it anyway so uh that's my and that's not a tweet but angelo will put it in a tweet for me once i tell her that (laughs) actually i think you did you just did a very successful tweet and I would love to see this happen here in Kansas City. I think this would really blow a lot of people away to see this. And the thing that's so intriguing about you, Paul, and I see this a lot, is I think there's not enough credence paid to longevity. And how many of you cats have been around huge outfits and supported them throughout the years and have also put, it's almost as though this is coming out because you've been so busy supporting so many other acts. So it's so good to see you step out and be your own person and put this out there after so many years of kind of being a part of other outfits. Do you ever get kind of that feeling that it feels good? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And I think those other outfits like, uh, contributed to my growth to get me to this period. So for, for sure. Yeah. I, I think that it's, it is. And, and, you know, it's a lot, a lot of people don't get to do that or don't even think to do that. And that's too bad because you're, you're losing like all those experiences that that person had that he could give, you know, and, and, and let you in on that uh, you weren't aware of. Yeah, it has to be an amazing adrenaline rush to be around something that big because I've spoken to other people that have played brass in big outfits and uh, feel that energy of that many people on that many stages in that many parts of the world just has to provide an exponential amount of growth as a human. Oh, totally. I mean, like I can remember uh, uh, with the Stones playing um, the uh, soccer stadium in Prague, Czechoslovakia, and there were almost 200,000 people. Wow. And when you come out on stage and look at that, that's 
that's uh, that's overwhelming, right? <laughs> oh man, are you kidding? <laughs> right, you know, and it, it's like a sea of people, and it was amazing because uh, you know, and traveling with them was so amazing because uh, of it was like a city traveling, you know, forty trucks, two stages, leapfrogging, and you know, and then the band, and uh, we all travel together. And uh, but like when we come into Prague. Uh, that was during the period when the wall was coming down in, in, in Germany and Prague, uh, had a, had a statue of Stalin at the entrance to the city. And it had been torn down and a big tongue was put up for these stones. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So that, was, that was pretty amazing. I mean, it was just an amazing experience, you know? Yeah. And so, uh, so the yeah, te- and I te- had many others, like with Robert Plant and <laughs> Jake Isles and uh, Pat Benatar. I mean, just there. <clears throat> you could you could look at my discography and sort of see. Absolutely. Well, it just shows the power of the testament of, of music and how powerful it is. Whether it's an intimate room in Kansas City or a massive stadium in Prague, it's something that I love. Like. I love intimacy. I think that's different. I think for for especially for jazz products products for jazz projects the the uh intimacy is important because the the listener can get they're not like it's a it's a show where everybody's jumping around on stage you know what i'm saying it's more of like the the solid figure standing there putting out his art or her art uh to the public and to be close to it, I think you get more out of it. So I I also love intimate settings as well. Absolutely. Well, Paul, Angela, thank you for painting an intimate picture of this project. And is the best place to pick it up on Bandcamp? Where can they go and get Legacy? Oh, uh, we actually have our own website uh, where it is available for download, outrageous 8 com. also available on Amazon and streaming on all platforms now. Uh, so we are really thrilled because it's been uh, really popular and, uh, and people are downloading it and enjoying it a lot. So it is available now on outrageous 8 com. Well, thank you both for taking time out. It's great to see you, and best of luck with the project and everything else. Thank you thanks. so much for having us. It was amazing. Yes, Absolutely. thanks for having us. Thanks for tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players and minds in L.A., New York City, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to both Paul and Angela for their time, energy, and devotion to the craft. If you want to hear more Neon Jazz interviews, you can find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Subscribe to us at YouTube, and for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.